All right, thank you, and welcome to another talk story. And this time we have another guest with us. Thank you for joining us. And can you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Patrick. Um, my name is Eric Katowai, and I'm from the Solomons. I'm currently working at uh, the University of the South Pacific, uh, lecturer, uh, senior lecturer in environmental. Thank you, Eric. Good to see you again. And uh, it's been a while. Now, Eric, can you share with us your background? Because I know that you've been working in uh, the envir our environment in Solomon Islands for quite some time. You did your master's <clears throat> and also your PhD looking at uh, regeneration in log forests on Kolobangara Island. Can you give us a little snippet of your research in Solomon Islands? Thank you, Pat. Um, so my, my master was, was basically on um, the land use changes on uh, floristic uh, composition, uh, really looking at understory uh, species, on, on Koloba. So we looked at different types of land uses. Um, Long was one of them. Um, we looked at uh, the impact of plantation and raising uh, coconut plantations and commercial plantations. Um, yeah, so that was quite a while. Um, and we published a couple of papers on that and on that study. But I started focusing more on logging. Um, I'm interested in the impact of logging because, as we all know, that logging does have um, environmental impact. But that statement is quite broad. There's a lot of um, impact you can actually and you can specifically look at. Um, so I decided to do regeneration dynamics that is affecting the regeneration of log forests um, in the Solomon. In looking at Kolobang, because Kolobang does have a lot a, a long history of logging. Um, logging actually started in Kolobangara in the early 1950s. So we actually had, you know, forests that have been logged um, over different time frame. Yeah, so that's basically what we've been doing. And uh, after that research, we are now basically looking at ways in which we can potentially restore the forest, not looking at a landscape operation at the moment, but looking at experimentations. I'm looking at which techniques work, um, and hopefully we can workshop that to to communities and also to communities in all parts of the Solomons. It is really a big issue in the Solomons. Yeah, thank, oh, that's interesting. Now, for those that are unaware, uh, Kolobangara Island is a very interesting island in in Solomons because it's an island that has attracted a lot of research and most of the biodiversity research ecology research even you know genetics to do with wildlife have come from kolobangara island in fact jared diamond did his dissertation on kolobangara island and his old campsite is called professor campsite and at one stage kolobangara island also had the longest forest monitored plot set up by T.C. Whitmore, I think, uh, there right. on the north uh, side of the island, I think around Poitete. Uh, that, that forest plot has now been um, deforested. So that's history. Yeah. It's, that's now history. <laughs> that's now history. So it, it kind of highlights also the impacts of logging on on the island and not just Kolobangara, but logging anywhere in the Solomons. Now let's talk about logging in the Solomons. There's a few pieces that have come from looking at the policy and uh, you know different aspects of the logging industry in, in Solomons. As we know, the logging industry is also an important sector for the economy in the Solomons. So Many times in decisions that are made, it is it leans towards economic more than it does towards sustainability. And Solomons has one of the probably the worst 
rate of deforestation and logging practice, unsustainable logging practice on Earth. Not well, let's not talk about the Pacific. This is on the planet today. What you know? Can you, if you were to provide some advice to government, you know, what would be the ad- advice you would you would give to ensure there's some sort of sustainability within the industry? That's, that's a really good question. And I think that's a question that everybody is asking um, at the moment. We actually had a, a, a paper published in 2015 that actually looks at the factors that affect or that drives logging in the Solomons. And there were, I think, six factors that we we've, we've discussed in that paper. And um, one of the, the, the factors is, is economic development. As we perhaps some of us know that you know logging is very important for the economy of the country. Um, it, it actually contributes about fifty to seventy percent of the of the export revenue. I mean for the country. So you know if you to remove logging from from that equation, then then you know the Solomon Islands economy is going to plummet because there's at the moment there's no alternative measures that have been put in place. So. We do have, I mean, the Solomon government does have policies, um, but unfortunately due to, due to manpower, um, finance, some of these policies not, have not really been monitored. So loggers tend to just go and do whatever they want to. And um, unfortunately, you know, even when it comes to re-entry logging, uh, which is, you know, re- revisiting an area that has already been logged, there's no policy that states, you know, how long you will allow that uh, forests to recover before you go back and do a second logging or third logging. Um, so any landowner can just invite a company um, and, you know, a middleman or the licensee can just come in and, and just, you know, uh, facilitate the process um, and bring some a company in into an area that has been logged maybe a year ago or two years ago. Um, so one thing that the government, I think, needs to really look at at the moment is to try and, and um, put in some, some sort of policy that that restricts re-entry logging, uh, re-logging of areas um, that, ha- that have been logged in the past. And hopefully by doing that should basically stipulate how, I mean, how long the, the forest can regenerate um, so that can have timber volume for logging. Again, as you mentioned, the logging practices in the Solomons are perhaps some of the worst in the in, in not only in the Pacific but in the world. Um, and it's in, in some previous studies, the, the logging uh, practice at the moment is perhaps about nine percent, nine nine times the um, the sustainable rate, which is quite high. Yeah, so I think it's it's really a challenging situation at the moment. The government is trying to, to utilize logging as, as a form of, of um, revenue, uh, creating avenue, but at the same time, they need to, to try and put some policies in order for them to, you know, for the forest to regenerate so that we can have this resource sustained for, for future. Now, uh, this is perhaps uh, something that is is of a hope to a lot of people because it's happening on the ground. Um, yeah, so we're just trying to, to remind the government through some of the science or the findings that we, we or in the papers that we published, just to, to keep reminding uh, the government and people, especially our younger generation who are now educated, uh, to see the importance of sustaining this resource, the timber resource that we have. Um, and uh, the Solomon Islands, we, we are blessed to have you know, high volumes of, of, of timber. High, our forests have high biomass, in other words. Um, so if we are not careful, you know, these forests are perhaps going to, to turn into some other vegetation perhaps in the future. This is theoretical. It happens in, in other places. It might happen in the Solomons as well, although regeneration is really good because of the climate. Um, but if we continue with the high intensity harvesting and you know no control in re-entry logging, then yeah, we might have grasslands in some parts of the of the islands. Yes, especially if that is coupled with climate change, then uh, the impacts uh, may be uh, great. 
Now, we hear about most of the negative impacts of logging in, in Solomons, but there are some examples of successful forestry, and maybe it pays to highlight industries that are more sustainable. And the only sustainable model that we have at the moment in the country is once again on Kolobangara. So you have all the you have the examples of what not to do on the same island and the <laughs> examples of what to do in terms of sustainable forestry on the same island. And here's the uh, the model that we've always highlighted in terms of sustainable forestry, the Kolobangara Forest Plantations Limited. Now, KFPL is a FSC or Forest Stewardship Council certif certified company, which means that it logs, or well, it plants its trees and then it harvests the trees at a sustainable rate. And it also has a protected portion of the fixed term estate which is the 400 meter contour of the island because the island Kolobangara is almost spherical and in, in, it's almost uh, perfectly circled. So it's an old dormant volcano. And so because it has been a FSC certified company for a long time, it's been able to uh, export its timbers at a higher premium price than a normal company would. Now, in terms of the biodiversity, maintaining the biodiversity within that fixed term estate, the company's fixed term estate, they've done a really amazing job because they have also partnered with environmental organizations to help manage and maintain that protected area status within the, within the timber company. So I guess, Another thing that I'd like to highlight here is this partnership. For a very long time, industry has seen us as, an, as conservationists and more and environmental managers as, a, as the enemy when really we should be working hand in hand to better ma maintain and manage resources. So it's the... I've never seen an industry, especially a forestry industry that has worked in, in, in close proximity with researchers and environmentalists and, uh, you know, biodiversity researchers to uh, maintain certain aspects of the, of the habitat and the species that are endemic and are representative of that island, things that make that island special. So that's, that's a model that I think could work elsewhere. But another thing that makes Kolobangara a little different is that the land is owned by the company. And so the human aspect, unfortunately, is removed. Whereas in a island that has a land owner control, uh, you'll have a lot of elements that are vying and fighting and you know so that can be a challenge as well now you've worked with kolobangara forest plantations limited kfpl can you share some of your experience working with kfpl yeah uh, kfpl has been you know very supportive to to my research and, and to other um, researchers as well coming in from abroad i think they do have a very good intention you know, to support biodiversity um, across the island and, and working along with communities as well. As, as you mentioned that uh, around three quarters of the island uh, is, um, is owned by, is alienated land and it's, it's actually, um, yeah, it's been taken over by that uh, plantation company. Um, only a quarter of the island is still customary land up to the 400 meter contour. Yeah, so currently KFPL has been supporting local growers around the island with seedlings I mean, to, 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 to try and um, come up with some sort of, of sustainable um, you know, uh, plantation um, just to, to earn some money. I think that's the, the, the main um, challenge that not only people in Kolobangara, but you know, everywhere in the Solomons and I'm pretty sure in the Pacific region as well. But the challenge that we are facing is, is how to, to earn um, money. We are now living in a cash economy. 
um, in a world that is in the Solomons we use this phrase manina toko. Um, yeah, so um, KFPL has been very instrumental in helping people set up their own plantations by providing seedlings and and also facilitating biodiversity research across the island. Um, they actually have this association which we call Kipka, which involves local communities as well, mapping out their, their land, uh, looking at you know, um, how best they can protect um, their environment, but at the same time, what, how can they, they earn a living okay, from the resources that they do have? Um, so as you mentioned, um, maybe traditionally, you know, people tend to see us environmentalists and conservationists as the enemy, where we come in and say, don't do this, you know, don't go there, um, you know, try, let's protect your forest. I think that mindset has changed over the years. I think we need to, to well, you know, um, protecting biodiversity, we, we need to use the resources within that, that landscape as well. Um, so one, one thing that I, I that, that, that is a potential um, move for, for Kolobangara is to, to try and, and do some sort of landscape man, management scheme where they plan out where to log, you know, where to, to have your reserves and, you know, what sort of resources do you have apart from, from logs? You know, if you have to have a river catchment area or if there's some species of, of importance, um, you know, we, we need to, to try and educate our people um, on Kolobara as well as in, in the Solomon Islands, as, you know, on how we can manage, you know, our, our landscape rather than just looking at a source of timber. Um, of the forest has other values as well. I mean, apart from ecosystem services, um, you know, people can, can actually earn okay, um, some form of income from their from the forest. Yeah, but back to your questions, KFPL has been really supportive to, to my research. And I'm thankful that we have people like um, Ferguson and others who are still there, um, you know, driving the biodiversity conservation, working with local locals on the ground and, and trying to, you know, to strike some sort of balance where people can conserve their resources, but at the same time, they can, they can earn something from out of it as well.